This is the Catholic Community of Practice and glad to be together. So it's a, a we're, we're able to be fairly informal, I think, with the size of the group and see what we would like to be about together. But I did send out uh, in an email a proposed kind of agenda and we can see where we want to go with it. I'll give a little welcome. I'm Maureen O'Brien and I've been um, facilitating this community of practice for several years now. So I thought I would give us a chance for initially some brief introductions followed by we often find we benefit from announcements of uh, things of relevance to our community of practice. So I thought I would put that at the beginning. And then I had sent us some uh, in the email had sent some initial questions for a brief initial reflection. So I'll give us a chance for reflecting on those and then giving some uh, initial individual responses to them. But then some more extended time after that for reflection discussion to see where those responses take us and then lead us into some future directions and closing. So we'll just see where the spirit leads us in the time that we have. And obviously, if we enter early, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. That all sounds good. We can proceed. So first of all, it's always a feeling of gratitude to come together as the Catholic community of practice at REA. Uh, I always feel great gratitude for Tom Groom and his continuing presence, his steadfastness with this group. I couldn't tell you how many years uh, Tom has gathered this group together. It uh, recedes into the mists of time uh, at REA APRI uh, as he has gathered us. Uh, I only know that uh, I picked it up in 2017. <laughs> so I have a chronology for myself, but, mm -hmm. uh, but Tom has been, uh, has been the guiding spirit of, of this community of practice and uh, gathered us for many years with, uh, meeting in person in many cities across uh, the United States and Canada. And so, uh, so in 2017, I started to do it. And for several years, uh, Charles Chisnavage also uh, graciously had been part of the um, convening. You can find um, some of the recent history of the community of practice at the REA website. We were taking some notes on what we had been doing. And so I, I put in the web link here on the slideshow, but you just go to the REA website and at the bottom of the website, they, they show uh, diff the links for the different communities of practice. So we're in there with some of the notes. And also for recent meetings where there have been recordings, when you look into the videos for the annual meetings, if you do a search, you can find recordings for ours among the others. So all that background is there for people who might be interested in some of the topics that we have uh, been working through. So that's a little background. So let's take a, a time for a, a quick introductions because we'll have more time later to get to know one another's interests and where we feel ourselves being led in religious education. But why don't we just start with uh, our name and where we're, we're currently from. And after we go just through that round of, of the, the quick introductions, then any uh, initial announcements that we want to make for uh, items that we think would be uh, helpful for the group to know whether it's about something we've done or something we know from our worlds or our institutions that we think others would be interested in. So uh, anybody can start. Uh, introduce yourself. Sure, I'll start. Is uh, my voice is, am I coming across all right? Yeah. Sure, no. Good, because I'm on my uh, smartphone. Wow, good. And uh, it's different, but my computer has been uh, not cooperative for a couple of weeks now. So, uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Noel Shul, and I live in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, Eastern Canada. 
I have lived here half my life, and the first half of my life I lived in uh, America uh, in various places, born and raised in Chicago. Um, I'm retired now from Memorial University of Newfoundland, where I was in the Faculty of Education for 20-some years, mm. um, because uh, religion was taught in the tax-supported schools of Newfoundland, and still is. Uh, but at the time that I first came, uh, the uh, one of the systems within the tax-supported schools was the Roman Catholic system. But there were three other religious groups that had schools, and my work in the Faculty of Education was to do the small thing that can be done in one or two courses, with uh, preparing religion teachers for each of the four denominational systems. Oh. Uh, they were all Christian, and there were no non-Christian or secular schools at the time. That all changed in 1998, and uh, now there are only two Catholic schools in the whole province, wow. and all the other schools are uh secular but they are still have religion as part of the curriculum so there's still a course in uh, teaching religion in primary elementary secondary schools in the faculty of education anyway that's goes beyond the length of time that you wanted maureen so sorry about that thanks no I'll jump in. Uh, good uh, morning here from here on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Chris Miller. I am a uh, religious uh, educator out in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. I earned my doctoral degree in education in 2019, and I'm excited to be uh, continuing formation. I'm actually headed to Boston on Sunday for a, a two-week program that uh, Tom's uh, better half <laughs> helps organize, so excited about that. Uh, and I have lost... <laughs> The last uh, four years, I've been teaching at a Catholic high school uh, in uh, in the Diocese of Oakland, the Lasallian Christian Brothers School. Uh, but I am uh, at the crux of doing something new and exciting. I'm a little bit nervous about it, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and that is uh, developing a training institute for Catholic high school campus ministers uh, in, in the United States. Unfortunately, there's no organization or university that specializes in high school campus ministry. And uh, so I think there's a great opportunity here. So I'm excited about that. Glad to be here. Good for you, Chris. That's a great initiative. Mm. Thanks, Chris. Chris, send me an email. Tell me more about it. Because I will do. We'll do. Yeah. Maybe if you're maybe we can meet up next week or the following yeah, if you're yeah. okay. but there could be local interest here. Yeah, great. We'll do. Chris, can I ask one question? Who are you doing that with? Like, is it you or you through some organization? Uh, at this point, it's me. I mean, I, I don't want to talk too much uh, about it just for out of respect to time. Uh, but, you know, I there is no national organization uh, that is supporting uh, Catholic campus ministers. Uh, the NCEA, which is the trade organization for Catholic schools in the United States, uh, has expressed interest and had past activities. Um, but uh, in addition, I have approached a couple of different universities and, uh, you know, a lot of people have said it's a great idea, but there just hasn't gained traction. So, you know, I, after 12 years in the space, I figured, you know what, <laughs> let's just do it. Let's go for it. So I've pulled together an advisory board and hoping to have an initial meeting in the next month. Hmm. That's awesome. I can go next, since I know everybody here, and everybody here knows me. So it's great to see old friends. Old, that's in the endearing sense, not chronological <laughs> report. Uh, I've been on sabbatical this past year, and I'm sabbatical on sabbatical this Christmas, or this uh, this summer. Um, and so, But soon I'll have to uh, put away, away the uh, the suntan lotion and the deck chair, the uh, the beach chair, and get back to work uh, this this September. And uh, I'm required to come back for one more year because they gave me a sabbatical. And then I, I hope if my health counter talked to, to do another year, 
And if I succeed, and Nick has heard me say this before, if I succeed in two more years and don't uh, break into gibberish and uh, bop bop and um, I'll have taught at BC for 50 years. So it's kind of a nice round figure. <laughs> so I think I'll, if I can, I'll probably uh, make it. Um, but it's been good, good sabbatical. And I've done almost nothing. Uh, didn't write a book. Uh, you know, I'd be repeating myself. Uh, but as I have said for the fifth time, um, if I wrote something, because I'd be repeating a lot of what I've already said. So who knows? Maybe I'll maybe I'll pick up something over the summer. But um, yeah, so it's been good. I'm in good health, thank God, and uh, still blessed to be at Boston College and uh, <clears throat> wonderful people like yourselves coming through. Um, yeah. Oh, there's Hospital has arrived. <laughs> My chair. <laughs> I was going to say your your uh, true confessions here when your chair arrives. Um, <laughs> hi, <laughs> hi, Hoffman. We're just uh, giving uh, brief introductions at this point. Mm -hmm. well, I'm Maureen O'Brien. I I have been yes, I know a good many of you. Uh, but uh, I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I retired a year ago from Duquesne University, where I was 26 years, and am finding my way at this point. Finding I've got, gotten to the busy stage, uh, figuring out what I want to be busy at, uh, though. And uh, so it's at this point, it's it's uh, finding certainly a calling that is reflected through a lot of what's going on in this conference in terms of ecology and the climate crisis and looking to, to ways that I can join my religious education and pastoral ministry background with local efforts for creation care. So that's one dimension of it. Another is longtime commitments I've had at Duquesne in um, the charism of the spirit and uh, fathers who, who founded Duquesne and Spirit and Pedagogy, and so continuing to do projects in that area. So um, so that's that's me at this point. Thanks. Maureen, for a long time, the spirits, as you know, were known as the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost Fathers. <laughs> I'm glad they changed their name. That's right. Their high school in, in the Philly area is still called Holy Ghost Prep. Oh, fair so. enough. Good. <laughs> um, I'll go. I'm Israel Diaz. I am an instructional designer at Candler School of Theology. Uh, before coming to Candler, I was in Catholic education for 24 years, where I taught first social studies, and most of the time I was teaching high school theology. Uh, my doctor of ministry focused on the manner in that digital technology is shaping religious education and its ability for evangelization through that education. And I'm um, currently working on my own personal project on looking at how scripture can shape uh, our understanding of religious education in missionary key. So I've looked into ecclesial documents, Second Vatican Council is what I've written on for my dissertation and some publications. So I'm looking out to look at what, what, what does scripture say? Uh, in particular, I'm looking at the theology of creation. And then as I begin to sort of work, what religious ed and missionary key for the first 21st century look like, then be able to consider or ground pedagogies and uses of technology in that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you already went, but let me just... Uh, uh, get on board uh Hosman Ospino and I, <laughs> first I thought that I was in the wrong meeting I thought it was a Boston College kind of graduates or connected people <laughs> meeting you know so but uh Israel will welcome you as well into the BC community so <laughs> and um uh, so uh professor of theology and uh, religious education at Boston College and Klaus School of Theology and Ministry uh, and doing well, you know, I mean, it's been a a, a great experience uh, to continue to work uh, here at BC. Today, I just finished teaching a three-week course uh, this morning, 
uh, called Spiritual Sources of Catholic Education, 29 amazing students who are passionate about the idea of Catholic education. I was just uh, so inspired by them. And uh, we actually were reading some of, uh, one of your uh, your latest publication, Nate, you know, so we, we discussed that in class today. That actually was the, the reading that actually generated most conversation this morning. So thank you for writing it in Commonweal. And uh, and then uh, no, working on a couple of national projects that, you know, for which I have uh, received some generous funding. Yeah. And uh, everything's going well, you know, working with great colleagues and great students. So that's pretty much my update. Thanks, officer. <laughs> so I'll jump in. Um, I, this is Eileen, and I live now in Old Orchard Beach, Maine. Um, which rocks because I can go off the beach anytime I want. Um, and uh, I'm officially retired from Boston University School of Theology where I was running the demon and transformational leadership. Uh, but so now I get to play, I get to play. So the app that I had made 20, uh, 12 ish years ago, 13 years ago, um, I'm turning into a website. The college showed me something on Tuesday that's like, oh my goodness, this I, this could all be done through AI. So I'm having all kinds of thoughts. Anyway, so but the website will be uh, up and running whenever I kind of get around to putting artworks on the rest of the pages. Um, we're doing the digital. Uh, Digital Technology and RE program next year, me and Annie. Um, thanks to all of you affirming that. Um, I have a hypothetical project going with Catholic TV, um, a, a series called The Art of the Church, in which each episode I go into a church and riff on the artworks in that church some history, some RE, some blah, blah, blah. Um, but although we've taped six episodes and I'm in the process of writing the scripts for two others, yeah, we've not aired any of them yet uh, because it's, uh, it's a um, editing intense process to put me, the images of me going blah, 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 together with the B-roll of <laughs> close-ups and the pan outs and the pan ins on all of the artworks. Um, and so they haven't done any of that yet. So maybe someday there's gonna be a series on Catholic TV called The Art of the Church. Um, uh, what else is going on? Those are the biggies. There's some writing projects that are maybes in my head, but uh, they may have to all wait until after this year of REA stuff. Thanks, Marilyn. Well, I, for one, I'm really glad about your theme. I'm really excited about what you guys are doing, of course. And I'm really glad your app is going to go onto the website in some way because I've missed it. I really liked it as an app. Um, I'm Mary Hess. I'm on the faculty of Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, have been for 24 years um, in a position in educational leadership. I think, Nick, you may be the last person. Hey, friends, I'm I'm Nick, a uh, doctoral student at uh, the Cloud School of Theology and Ministry, um, the Theology and Education Program. Um, it's Boston right now. I'm in Dorchester. Um, I invite you all to come to the next session since uh, Mary and I will be leading different parts of it. So just everyone's invited. Bring all your family and friends, as many clicks as possible. Um, <laughs> like Hoffman said, I just have finished up a, uh, a fellowship with Commonweal writing about LGBTQ issues uh, in the Synod. Um, 
I'm about a week or two late for an article for Jim Martin uh, for his outreach website on the Eucharistic Revival. Uh, just a summer full of conferences and presentations and working on book chapters, all that kind of stuff as I finish up my my last coursework uh, this summer and start prep for comps in the fall. Um, I'm going to be, t I'm gonna be um, TAing for Cal and Contextual Ed, so we're working with our grad students in Contextual Education courses. I'm really excited about that. Um, I was a high school teacher for a very long time. Uh, <laughs> I miss meeting in the classroom. And um, well, I'm teaching my first undergrad course this fall in theology, so I'm just, I'm really, really excited about that. Um, and that's me. I'm Nick. Hi, friends. <laughs> Hi, Nick. Hey. Thanks, Nick. Thanks to you all. So there were a lot of uh, there was a lot of good information there, not only about you as individuals, but some some helpful things happening at your institutions and in terms of your own accomplishments. Are there any other announcements that people have for for uh, general interest about good stuff going on? Yeah, can I just share? Um, I've been working with the Catholic Mobilizing Network this last year with a group of people to pilot a uh, training program to bring restorative circle practice into parishes around issues of synodality to, set, to try to sort of show the way in which the restorative justice circle work they've been doing for years um, aligns itself well um, with a synodal <laughs> imagination. And that um, training manual and associated things are about to be released publicly. If they haven't already, I should go to the website and see. But that'll be a free resource for at the parish level, which probably could be drawn on for high school settings for older kids. Um, and then there will also be a series of um, webinars made available. So you should keep an eye out for that um, as it comes out. So you want to just say a little more about the two grants, uh, the one, uh, well, uh, well, Haciendos and, uh, and then about the, the CLO grant? Uh. Well, sure. Uh, uh, this is, uh, for, for, I guess that most of you have heard about this, but this is a, a, a couple of projects that uh, I'm working on. Uh, and both are funded by the Lilly Endowment, which, you know, has been a great partner in, in recent years. Uh, I have to give uh, a shout out to Tito Madrazo, who is, you know, joined the endowment a few years ago and has been very instrumental in uh, bringing more attention to the reality of a church that is becoming increasingly Hispanic. So Tito himself is not Catholic, although he raised in a was raised in a Catholic family. He's a Methodist uh, minister, ordained minister, and uh, but but knows Catholicism very well and and works very closely with many Catholic theologians and so on. So uh, one of the projects uh, is called Haciendo Caminos, you know, and this project uh, is uh, a seven point nine million dollar uh, grant that we received uh, two years ago. It's a partnership with the University of Notre Dame. We both are co-investigators uh, on this within <laughs> Madalena. And uh, the idea is to uh, support at least 100 Latino, Latina uh, students who are US born, US raised, and they are uh, considering a vocation to ministry in the Catholic Church. So this is not for doctoral students or for academic life. We're focusing on U.S. born, U.S. raised Latinos, Latinas who want to be in parishes or campus ministry settings or just ministerial settings in general. But we want to really be attentive that this is a generation that often gets uh, forgotten. You know, most ministers in the Hispanic community or who are Hispanic are immigrants, like myself. So uh, we want to really start shifting the needle you know, towards the U.S. born population because that's where the majority of Latinos are uh, uh, these days. So it's been a successful project, you know, and uh, it's about uh, providing fellowships. We're working with 18 different universities 
that in itself, you know, is a part-time uh, job, but we're doing well. We're managing. We have a director for the project uh, as well. And then the other project is called Nuevo Momento. And uh, that project is uh, is funded by, a, supported by a $15 million uh, uh, grant from the endowment. And uh, the project is about identifying, which we already did, we invited 15 organizations that are specialized, that focused on ministry with Hispanic Catholics. And so these are the organizations that have some influence and impact at the national level. And the goal is to professionalize or help these organizations to be more uh, professional and be more, uh, uh, actually to be stronger in, the, in what they do uh, administratively, financially, and so on. So each of the organizations are going to go through a process of uh, building capacity, organizational capacity building, actually that's the best word. And then uh, they will receive uh, sub-grants to invest in themselves and strengthen uh, their capacity at various levels. So it's an exciting, two exciting projects. I'm working with exciting people uh, as well. So, and it's a lot of work, of course, but uh, the energy that emerges from these projects really, really keeps me going. Folks, if you, in case you weren't doing the quick math, Osman has raised something like what, 22, 23 million dollars. For this for these two projects, for these almost two projects. 23 million dollars. But in total, I have raised almost 26 million dollars. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry for I missed a couple of minutes there. Oh, there you have it, you know. Just... <laughs> <laughs> but it's just a huge achievement. And it's a it is initiative and imagination and creativity and and dedication and competence and and charm. Uh <laughs> <laughs> They're all necessary to get that kind of funding and to be able then to spend it wisely and well, because it becomes a huge responsibility, obviously, but he's glorying in it, flourishing, rather than being overwhelmed. I'd be overwhelmed, but wondering what to do with all this money. But he's doing it well, so we're proud of you, Cosman. Okay. Well, then, uh, thank you all. Let us move toward some reflection together. So what I was suggesting for initial conversation was this question, and I'll give you a chance to reflect on it, and then, uh, an initial round of maximum two minutes each. And some of this may already emerge from what you've been thinking and talking about in the introductions, but what is one initiative I've taken in religious education over the past year, more or less, that has felt especially promising, or something that I've read, observed, or mentored in someone else's work that has felt especially promising to me? So that's the focusing question. So take some time, maybe close your eyes, but think about that.
So for up to two minutes, I'll give each person a chance to share and maybe use that inviting style where uh, each one after they've shared something invite someone else uh, to take it next. So I'm going to start by inviting uh, Israel if he's ready and if somebody's not ready they could always pass and send it to somebody else. Uh, thank you, Maureen. Um, what I've done this, well, starting previous year, my last year teaching high school, was I was teaching sacraments and ethics. And what I began to do is start using a model of practical theology to create my lessons and units. So, for example, it would be some activity uh, that allowed the students to look at a particular aspect of their reality, bring that to mind as they began to start looking and reflecting on it in light of the uh, sacramental theology, for example, that we're dealing with, and then um, eventually come with some kind of um, way of providing some resolution to that context in light of what they were learning. And so it was a way of bringing in being intentional, but also sort of shifting towards uh, project-based learning. Uh, and sort of sneaking it in, right, uh, within what is the traditional models of assessments. Along with that was using understanding by design as a way to start thinking about what the outcome would be, so that along with typical formative assessments, I will create types of scaffolding assessments that would allow me to give students um, feedback along the way as they began to sort of build different elements of, of the learning and the final project. And that's sort of uh, sort of what brought me to Candler. And currently this week, we're preparing for a three week uh, seminar for faculty that's called Engage Pedagogy. Uh, and one of the things is about how do we use instructional design uh, to be able to create equitable spaces for learning and engaging spaces for learning. Uh, that can not only rely on traditional, but also find new creative assessments and also help students to be more contextual mm -hmm. and provoke more contextual theology among students. You invite someone? Um, Nick. <laughs> that was really cool. I like that. Um. <clears throat> I, the first thing that pops into my head, because um, I just uh, applied to do a breakout session there again, the, the Ignatian Family Teaching for Justice. Um, the Jesuits, right, host that big um, social justice conference uh, every fall for high school, college kids. Um, last year, I did a session kind of like very much about my work, like querying Jesuit secondary education in the U.S. And um, I did a like a breakout session where it was just like, a, they called it like hopes, joys and hopes, griefs and anxieties, just like a space for LGBTQ high school students just come together and just reflect. Like there wasn't me talking at them. I gave them reflection questions, put them in like pairs and triads. And then we had some large group conversation and it was so beautiful and so sacred. And the, like these high school kids are miles ahead of like all of our research and all of our work. So like, so for me, like, how do I learn from them? How do I let them take the lead in this? Especially as we're looking at models of synodality. Um, and I and I applied to today to kind of do the pretty much the same session again. Like I had this pack room. I was so, I felt so alive. Like, yes, this is the work that I need to be doing. It's work that the church needs. Um, so yeah, so like <laughs> making a space, not just like teaching them about anything, just that ministry of accompaniment and presence to so like, I'm here, I'm holding space for you. How can we support each other? And it was really beautiful. And hopefully we can do it again. Um, I'm going to call on Mary. I love that. I, I, that's just, Nick, that is so um, energizing to hear. Um, I was thinking about um, circle practice, right? Which is an indigenous for, uh, epistemology. And here in the in Minnesota, where we have 11 sovereign nations and we have a Native American lieutenant governor, and there's a lot more work that's being done on 
uh, land back and all sorts of other things. It's been the circle practice, the sort of dialogical um, way of gathering in circle that has been just transformative. And it's transformed my own teaching because I do a lot of teaching in Zoom and other spaces and I have a hard time shutting up enough to listen carefully. Um, you know, that's maybe uh, the seductive thing for professors. And so um, putting a circle practice in where you only talk when you've got the talking piece um, has been a really good discipline for me. And I have just noticed so much um, wonderfully transformative stuff happening in circle um, at, in so many different contexts. I mean, we have basic income pilots going on in the Twin Cities. Um, we have all this um, watershed stuff happening. I mean, it's just like, it just, it, it just energizes me. And so this morning when... Um, Ben was talking about the BTS Center's emphasis on companionship and widening the aperture. I thought those two words are precisely what I've seen happen in circle practice. So, um, so that gives me great hope. Uh, and and I, I just, I love seeing how that's unfolding in uh, across churches and synagogues and um, mosques and just all these different and multi-faith spaces across languages. It's just, it just gives me a lot of hope. Um, so anyway, um, I am going to invite Eileen. Thank you, Mary. That all sounds awesome. But yeah. Can I, yeah. Um, I'm going to take this in the direction of someone I've been mentoring. Um, cause you know, even though you stop officially working for the university, the students don't always take that seriously, so they stay in dialogue. Um, so there's a guy uh, who is an ordained Methodist, but um, hasn't worked for a church in some time. His uh, day gig, he and his wife own a cheerleading gym in Georgia. And so very into the sports model, and they get it, and... You know, they've been attentive to the fact that, well, kids stopped coming to religious education programs at church because they, they meet at the same time as there's practice. Whether that's Sunday morning or Wednesday afternoon or whatever, there's a practice of some sports team then. And so he's kind of taking that sports team model and creating a uh, a youth ministry, a non-parish church-based ministry thing that's more modeled on doing and preparing them in dialogue to do good in the world um, without it being um, a particular without having a particular denominational uh, affiliation. Um, and I think it's, I think it's interesting. I think the fact that it's, there's room for Jesus and others to show up in it. Uh, but kids are joining it because they like the work that they get to do and the, and the skill sets that they learn on working together and being leaders because they're the ones who are leading the the service ministry that they're doing so one of the things they do is a monthly birthday club for people with special uh, education needs um uh and they support the 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 cheerleading gym has a um a special a special abilities cheering team um and the kids in the I'll, i'm going to call it a ministry group even though it's a service group are the ones who kind of lead the support for um supporting the kids in these programs anyway it's it's an interesting structured thing that's post-church and I know I've talked for more than two minutes so thank you
Oh, and I have to call on somebody. Um, uh, and so I look at the participants and I see, no, what are you up to? <clears throat> um, less than you are, Eileen. So, <laughs> so far, anyone else? Um, the the question made me reflect on <clears throat> if I were still actively involved in religious education. Let's start there. I I would give a much more attention, especially if I were uh, involved, not so much in teaching religious education, but in teaching religious studies. I think in light of the uh, our meeting of the REA this time, I would give much more attention to the whole matter of environments in which various religious things happened in the past and happen now, <clears throat> an environment uh, not confining it to climate, but also so the general thing that in the literature is usually simply referred to as setting the setting for things and how that may have changed over time. So uh, if I were teaching certainly a, a course, for example, in the New Testament, I would give much more attention to, well, what was the environment in which all this stuff happened in uh, the New Testament, the various books? And uh, then also include the question, so what are these places like now? And uh, in some cases, perhaps virtually no change, but drastic changes in so many of them, especially when you think within the framework of Roman Catholic education, the, the many sites in ancient times that were Roman Catholic and are no longer that, and others that uh the the buildings may still exist but the whole sense of what those buildings were about uh are not and then the whole matter of climate um so I, i'm gonna wait until i see the tea, 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 tea. maureen <laughs> and then i'll shut up um at the uh, when I ask myself, well, what am I doing in religious education? Uh, what comes to mind immediately? For example, I belong to a book club, and it's amazing how many novels one can read now, even historical novels, in which you would never know that religion ever existed. So I make it a point. That's that's the, the what a ten minutes is that a ten minute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's it. Um, anyway, I, I always make it a point to uh, uh, either point out the absence or if there are things going on, uh, and I have several recent stories about that. But anyway, I try to clarify what some of these religious things are, which either do not or do show up within the framework, even if... It's enough for now. And to, it's easy to call on uh, someone. I don't think uh, Chris is still available, although probably listening from what he said, but Tom Groom, of course. So <laughs> take it away, Tom. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Yeah, well, hi, everybody. Um, the, the, as I said, I've been on sabbatical this past year. I didn't do very much of anything other than uh, did some lectures and travels, but didn't write very much. But I've, I've gotten fired up recently um, about this business of synodality and what it might mean for religious education. And the hospital has done some good work on this as well. But in many ways, when you stand back from what they're talking about, like it does, like, you know, this whole thing could fizzle out, you know, when, when Francis goes home to God. Uh, the next pope may set it aside, and it'll be we'll, we'll remember it maybe. But but I don't think that's going to happen. I I think it has more potential, has tremendous potential. It could revolutionize the church. It could, as Pope Francis often likes to say, turn the church upside down. In other words, take what had been at the top 
and put it at the bottom of that, being at the bottom, put it at the top, so that it turned, uh, pyramid, the, the, the pyramid turned upside down. And it, it, they have all this rhetoric uh, about participation and collaboration and conversation um, and everybody getting to speak their word and be heard and taken seriously and included and all this. Mm. And it, it obviously calls for a pedagogy that would prepare people for this kind of faith. Because uh, it does look as if the Holy Spirit really may intend us to keep on with this with this effort. And but what's the kind of pedagogy or the education that would prepare people to be synodal Catholics, uh, synodal Christians? Um, and obviously, I mean to take the obvious, and I'm singing for the choir. Um, I mean, the, when when the the Council of Trent defined faith simply as belief belief in the official doctrines of the church. We made a catechism that summarized the beliefs. Who made the world? God made the world. Who is God? God is the Father in heaven. And now, but obviously, patently, that kind of catechesis, I know it's dead and gone, but just to make the point, wouldn't, would never prepare people for synodality. Uh, if, they, if it did, it'd be a miracle. Um, but, but what is the pedagogy? And what is the, uh, the, the kind of, of uh, processes and dynamics and encouragements we need to be be uh, crafting and, and implementing. Uh, and I say fidelity, as far as I'm concerned, has to begin in kindergarten, um, where you would prepare little people in kindergarten and maybe preschool uh, in the values and the perspective and the horizon that that is presented to us by this notion of synodality, that we all work together and honor everybody's gifts and include them all. Now, there have been negative signs. The most recent uh, instrumentum laboris, I haven't read it. It just came out a couple of days ago. Um, you know, it avoids the controversial issues and all this kind of stuff, which is disappointing. But I think when, when they get together, if 360 or 70 of them come together again the next October or whenever, uh, I think the Holy Spirit will blow it, blast the thing open and that everything will be back on the table. So LGBTQ rights and respects and uh, women in the church and ordination, of, uh, not just to diaconate, but to priesthood and uh, optional celibacy for priests and what have you. Um, so I, I think I think it'll all come back. And so God isn't finished with us yet. This will probably be a 500-year process before we Catholics become truly synodal uh, in our faith. <laughs> In our whole approach and how we set aside the hierarchical ordering with which we were raised and take on this radically communal uh, type of way of being together as church. So it's fun. So anyway, what's what, what's the pick And I have written something on it. I'm going to give a paper this November at a, an international gathering in Rome, um, which is some of you've heard me say I've never been invited to before. So it's kind of fun at the end of my days here in my senior years to finally get a type of invitation. But um, I didn't put out a, a, a paper because it's going to be the keynote paper at the conference. And uh, already there's been three major responses to it, all very positive and encouraging and saying, yeah, that this is a crucial issue for us. So who knows? Maybe it'll go well in November, that international conference. But whether it does or not, I, I, uh, I'm i committed to this notion. And especially it has clarified for me at least the kind of, in some ways, the kind of pedagogy I've been advocating all my life, participation and dialogue and conversation and all those good values. But um, it's lovely to see that the, the, they'd come around and to see the church taking on this kind of commitment. So let's hope it bears the kind of fruit that I think it has the promise of bearing, uh, unless, I said, we, uh, we turn around and go back ways. I think I'm the last. Is there anybody left that has to spoke? Yeah. I think uh, oh there's, no, no, there's there's Cindy Cindy just came in well what uh, Cindy we're reflecting on this question uh, up to two minutes uh, initial sharing so I'll I'll go next well, also don't forget Chris is there and Chris hasn't gone either so we've got a couple people yet okay. okay. Well, mine was, I mentioned that uh, I, I work uh, with uh, Spiritans and Spiritan pedagogy and, and not just Bob Spiritans, but everyone who owns the, the Spiritan ethos at Duquesne. So I uh, had a really lovely experience over the past year of working with the, uh, a Spiritan community of practice that included lay people as well as uh, Bob Spiritans. And uh, it was, it was, 
truly a community of practice that practiced a kind of synodal process and contemplative conversation and in the process but uh, felt called to plan a professional development day that again then involved both Fouth Spiritans and uh, spirit and friends or lay spirit and the whole kind of mix of people that met uh, prior to the spirit in this chapter then a few weeks ago at Duquesne and so it, it felt like an emerging model of religious education and formation and so being part of that process was I think life-giving for everyone involved and so as Tom and others have been sharing about these kind of synodal processes that seem like a clue and seem like the Holy Spirit moving um, in the church and moving, I think for me, this sense of what religious congregations and their charisms have to offer, which is not news, it's been long standing in the Catholic Church, but as they enter this new phase in their own history and what it means for uh, the, the continuation of the church as these nations undergo such profound dislocation in their own history, what, uh, what are they called to and what are we called to uh, in, in both education and formation and the carrying on of those charisms. It, it was a very moving experience. And I'll call on Chris if he's ready. I am, hopefully the reception is good enough that you can hear. Uh, so I, I gave a preview earlier in my introductory comments about, uh, you know, my, uh, one of the things that I'm working on uh, right now, uh, you know, I've been in the high school campus or in that, uh, my dissertation uh, was on the impact of the Kairos retreat program in, uh, in Jesuit high schools uh, you know, from the University of San Francisco. And uh, one of the things that I have come to recognize is that uh, high school campus ministry is, uh, doesn't really have a home. I mentioned earlier about, you know, NCEA as the trade association for Catholic schools uh, in the United States, um, but uh, they haven't been jumping up and down to wanting to support high school campus ministry. And so uh, just I was at earlier this week, actually, that I kind of made the decision to create a training institute for high school campus ministry and religion teachers after praying about it and reflecting and uh, connecting with a number of universities in the country. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think that there's an opportunity for, to buy, for people to have formation uh, in um, Minnesota High School campus and what that looks like, how that is different than, uh, you know, ministering in a youth ministry context. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm excited. I'm not really entirely sure you know, where, where God is leading uh, the effort. I'm excited about it. Um, and then uh, one thing that I've also been, I'm kind of cheating here a little bit and I'm going to bring up two different topics. Uh, but uh, the second area is around mental health. I've been doing a lot of work uh, around uh, education advocacy uh, of mental health in the Catholic Church. Uh, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, in the fall of last year unveiled a mental health campaign, uh, which I had been doing a lot of work behind the scenes over uh, the last, uh, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years. Uh, and uh, to get the bishops to do anything, <laughs> it, it can be really challenging in terms of time timing. But uh, there is uh, an opportunity here for the integration of, of mental health literacy uh, into uh, religious education. And uh, actually on last week, I uh, was uh, involved in a roundtable conversation with some Catholic uh, school leaders uh, around how uh, incorporate uh, mental health literacy, mental health education into uh, Catholic schools, Catholic education. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, unfortunately, misunderstanding uh, particularly around suicide, uh, you know, according to the Catholic Church, uh, catechism, yes, suicide. Of individuals that you know, die by suicide have some sort of illness. And so the question is, you know, how can we educate uh, the, the field uh, in terms of recognizing that, uh, you know, if somebody dies by, by suicide, uh, that has mental illness, 
that may negate the sinfulness part of it. Uh, and so there's a lot of education that can be uh, done. So anyway, all to say, I've been really excited and, and just two very different, you know, but actually complementary areas in a high school campus ministry and uh, mental health uh, suicide prevention. Okay, um, since I think you probably can't see us, uh, Chris, we'll just, uh, I'll just invite Hoffman to go. Thank you, uh, Maureen. Uh, I think that one of the most exciting, uh, actually, let me just, uh, because I need to time myself, otherwise I'll, I'll be, I don't want to go beyond my two minutes. Uh, one of the most exciting uh, projects, religious education projects this year, uh, in which I was involved, is the one project in which Nick actually participated, you know, and uh, <laughs> I did, you know, last year, Commonweal Magazine uh, launched a search for a writer uh, to write public on the Synod, public theology on the Synod, you know. So uh, I know the, the founder of the fellowship, you know, and uh, I, I'm familiar with some of the leaders at, the, at Commonweal Magazine. So they contacted me and they said, they asked me, do you know someone who can do this kind of work, you know? And at some point, they even asked me if I would be interested in writing on synodality and all this stuff. And I said, I mean, I have written a lot of stuff, you know, but it's time for a, for a new generation of public theolo theologians and public voices. And my proposal to them was, I, I told them, I know four, actually more than four, but I got these four brilliant, you know, emerging scholars at Boston College you know, who are really insightful, great religious educators, but they haven't had much of a chance to actually put their words out as public theologians. And what about if they were to be mentored by journalists, by people who actually know how to do this work well? Well, the idea panned out, you know, and then, uh, so uh, we, I proposed Nick, who is on this call, uh, Brenda Noriega, Cesar Valdelomar, and Kayla. What's what's Kayla's last name? Uh, August. August. Kayla August. Kayla August. And Kayla and, and Kayla August. You know. So they four, the, the four of them were invited to write essays throughout the year, but not just any essays. You know, these are super insightful essays with the you know, drawing from their own strength, you know, with resources to travel, with resources to do research, commission research, and so on. And then they had the entire team of a common wheel, of course, working with particular editors to review these essays and so on. But I got to tell you, the essays that were published during the past year by Nick, Brenda, Kayla, and Cesar, are wonderful essays cited almost everywhere. You know, I have seen them being cited in magazines, in other journals, and so on. And thank you for putting the, the link, Nick, you know? And to me, I think that this is, as I enter this kind of mid-career level of, uh, you know, more stage of my own career, you know, mentoring uh, the next generation of religious educators with a public voice, public theologians, it is uh, is something that we should we should all be doing, and I'm so grateful that Nick said yes, at, 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 as well as Kayla, Cesar, and Brenda. Cindy. Well, thank you. Sorry for being late. I was chairing the adolescent girls working group and we we ended our our session a little bit early so i thought i'd jump over here um so i'm sorry that i missed all the other wonderful things that um that were mentioned um one thing that um i've been working on for the last year and we'll continue into this next year is a grant that a colleague of mine and i got from ats to do what we're calling um critical conversations in Catholic education, which are um, sets of workshops on important topics with Catholic educators um, in the greater Toronto area. Um, as a bunch of you already know, I'm sure um, Catholic education in Ontario is publicly funded. So there are lots and lots and lots of Catholic schools and therefore lots and lots and lots of Catholic school teachers. 
Um, and we're really hoping to set um, Regis St. Michael's Faculty of Theology up as um, the go-to place for Catholic schools who want to have deep conversation about important things. Um, we've start, we started this year with some conversations around youth climate anxiety, and I would love to continue conversations over the over coming years on things like um, uh, what Chris was talking about, about mental health um, care with um, young teachers and young, um, young people in schools, um, LGBTQ issues in, um, in Catholic schools, um, questions about um, immigration and immigration status in Catholic schools. So all kinds of like really interesting, critical conversations that, um, that we hope will just be um, helpful for teachers who are trying to navigate these issues in their classrooms um, in ways that do justice, not only to the teachings of the church, but also to um, the commitments of um, the Canadian human rights um, statements and so on. So, so that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Let's, I think that's everyone. So let's take a minute and sit with the richness of what's just been shared. So now this is time for just open discussion and connections and observations. So about um, 10, 15 minutes uh, of responses. So what, what are our initial responses from these reflections about the direction of religious education, especially in our Catholic context? Um, are they showing us any areas of possible collaboration? Are they showing us areas that we need to relinquish in order to embrace new directions? Well, I'm the, I'll start. Um, Unless this is meditation time, is it? <laughs> or is now it you can start talking to me. <laughs> okay. Um, I live in an archdiocese that uh, the issues related to uh, abuse under the care of practices of one kind or another and by people involved in it is very much alive uh, as a topic. And I'm wondering to what extent um, in uh, preparation of teachers and uh, in uh, Catholic religious education generally, whether uh, attention is still that as a current issue rather than uh, perhaps something that other happened to other people sometime. Uh, that's that's one topic. Uh, the other has to do with the uh, many controversies surrounding the papacy and the Vatican uh, system, governmental system, uh, which certainly shows up regularly, at least in the Canadian Catholic paper, no, papers. Uh, and I'm just wondering uh, to what that shows up in the classroom in terms of exploring some of these issues that are uh, church-wide 
and not simply uh, local issues and not simply focused on the uh, the concerns of uh, particular groups, whether it's the, the topic of synodality on the one hand or the welfare of uh, Catholic students and the other. Uh, so that, that's a, th a second one. And there are a couple of others, but that's that's enough. Anyway, that, that's where I'm uh, interested to hear about. Something that I would like to, or that I'm observing as I listen to each other and also listening to Eileen last night when she was introducing the topic for of the REA meeting uh, for next year. Uh, one would assume that Catholics are uh, ahead of the game or at least up to speed when it comes to technology and the use of uh, you know, the latest technology, artificial intelligence, and so on, you know? But it seems like we really talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. You know, I mean, we, we talk a lot about being up to date and the signs of the times and so on. Eileen last night said, well, there isn't much written from the perspective of religious education and the use of technology, you know. And here today we have heard from Israel, from Eileen. Mary, we know that this has been part of your research, you know, for, uh, for, for, for many, many years and so on. And, and and I feel that, you know, that this is one of the directions that I see kind of open and screaming out loud, saying, come on, religious educators, more research on this, more writing on this, more collaborations on this, you know, because, I mean, if we at the level of academic research, you know, life are not doing this, just imagine the catechists, you know, in faith communities or the Catholic school leaders. They're asking those same questions, but they don't have the resources. So th this conversation has been encouraging, encouraging to, to me, at least in, in that regard. I may not be the scholar who writes about these things, but I can support others or at least make some noise for others to, to do it. Um, Bishop Paul Tai at the Vatican, uh, Dicastery for Culture, um, has been forefront pushing this for a decade now um, and uh, pulled together um, a conference a couple of years ago um, with scholars from a number of places. And recently the, the culture office published a book. Um, it wasn't in time for my class, but... Um, <clears throat> So they've they've done a lot. I'm actually kind of hoping he'll he'll agree to do a plenary next year. Um, so at least in the, you know in the the in that sense of what they're doing at the top of the pyramid, it, it is it is happening. Thank goodness. Um, it's not getting down to the practitioners unless they happen to be doing it. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I mean, I know that this didn't come up in the last round that Maureen put before us, but I'm all of a sudden kind of conscious again that because I live in Maine now, I live in mission territory. More than half of the priests in the Diocese of Portland, Maine, are not uh, Native born in the US, they're from Af Africa or South Asia. So, and they're good solid missionaries who are coming to look after us. But it means that they've got a bunch of cultural stuff that they're trying to learn. So they're busy with kind of other stuff as they start to run a parish. Um, and so is, I mean, to me, that's another thought about how do religious educators um, acknowledge our um, the, the changing nature of the North American Catholic Church. Noel, is it uh, is Newfoundland also mission territory?
need to unmute. Um, <clears throat> no, we have uh, uh, both the diocesan priests and we have uh, two religious orders, uh, Jesuits and the Redemptorists, who uh, serve, um, I believe, uh, just rarely in the past, in rural areas, I have run across uh, uh, miss missionary priests, for example, from Africa, who are serving in, a, in let's say, four, four rural parishes and make the rounds uh, mass once a month at each of them, so things along that line. But th those are fairly rare. Uh, other parts of Canada, I'm not so sure how they work. And I, you know, in talking with uh, friends who live uh, near Toronto, their parish priest is someone from Poland. So uh, that kind of thing is going on. And I don't know. Uh, uh, my fellow Canadian in, at the University of St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto, which is a <laughs> title, <laughs> would know more about that in terms of, uh, uh, especially in the urban areas of central Canada, mm. uh, the extent to which uh, the uh, what, uh, local priests, that is those born and raised in Canada, are still the uh, the main uh, servants, yeah. or relying more and more on, uh, especially on uh, European and African countries, uh, dioceses to uh, have allow some of their people to uh, work in Canada. Um. For what it's worth, I am actually a newcomer to Canada, so I can't speak for all of Canada. Um, but my experience here in Toronto has been that it's been um, there have been a, there are a lot of um, priests who have who have been born outside of Canada. Um, I I would suggest that all of North America is essentially mission territory at this point. Um, yes. You know, I don't think that um, that especially white born in the US or Canada, middle class, raised Catholic in that traditional way, um, that model of people who are preparing for the priesthood is is um, certainly not reflected here at Regis St. Michael's. The vast majority of people in our MDiv program, who are mostly Jesuits, fair enough, um, but most of them are, are not Canadian. And certainly not white. Yeah. If I could follow just quickly on, on Cindy's comment, there's an excellent essay in the New York Times today. It's just a brilliant essay on how conservative that the, the native, the North American or the US Catholic priesthood, the young people who are coming into priesthood are significantly right of center, are, are very traditionalist and uh, very self-righteous about their traditionalism. And it's their way of bringing the church back to the proper, to the proper place, etc. So it's just, it's just, um, yeah, it's a powerful essay and very well researched and what have you, but alarming, uh, alarming uh, that they would move this in a, they'd be very contrary to the spirit of Vatican II or the type of Pope Francis, etc. Et uh, anyway, a, a, a down note. Uh, yeah, just just building on on that, not to not to make it down uh, so much as just as the observation that so much of what was voiced in the in the earlier round about exciting things that are happening are happening in spaces outside the traditional structures. At least that was my observation. Uh, so so it's it's uh, it's for me a frustrating kind of disjuncture. That uh, that that how do we how do we I don't know what we do <laughs> go where the spirit leads us and and make good things happen but uh, but it but it is 
Um, yeah, Mary, Mary just put in the chat the fertile fringes. <laughs> yeah, work at the boundaries and, and try to make good things happen. And, and so much of what I've heard at this conference, too, has been happening at, at fertile fringes, uh, uh, both literally in the agriculture sense or the earth sense, but also fertile fringes of traditional structures. So, yeah. Nick? Um, I think that's why, uh, like what I've been hearing, that teaching synodality is so important. Um, that like ownership of the church in a very real way, right? Like as educators, we want our students to take ownership and mastery in, in whatever they're learning. Um, but I think especially in the church, right? Like they don't want to be passive recipients of like, all right, this person I don't know is just talking at me right next, all that stuff. Um, and I think that's why, like, like, Israel, like what you were doing with like your, your units by design, right? Like that you're teaching students to yeah. take ownership and to want to take ownership in this. Like what does teaching by design look like yeah. for synodality? How do we consistently right. practice this? So like people who, like the nuns, the folks who would want, like NONES, folks who'd want to leave the church because they're like, it's this traditional institution just like is not for me. I cannot do this anymore. We, yeah, like like ownership and agency in that, in in a way that they are a part of the creation of of something new. That they like that, that we are together are listening to the spirit. The spirit doesn't just talk to someone else; like it talks to them and with us through us. And so, especially I think combating this like really intense like MAGA style Catholicism, right? Like white Christian nationalism. We were talking about this yesterday. Um, in our, in our regional gathering, like white Christian nationalism. And it's, it, that like, it has very much has taken over the, the U.S. Catholic Church, right? Like the U.S. bishops have just cut like, so many jobs in the social justice realm. Like what, what does, if we're talking about environmental stuff, like what does synodality look like for kids in Mexico City? Because it's almost out of water, right? Like what, like how can we help train them in this synodal listening style because that itself like teaches encounter and openness and collaboration for these bigger eco justice projects mm -hmm. and i think that we can be um teaching young folk about synodality and how to do synodality i think is like really is this like i was really critical of synodality when i started this common wheel project but like i the more and more i listen and i learn and i work with it the more I'm like i i really do think that this is a way to especially for young folk be like no you have a say in this too yeah yeah i think my takeaway as i hear this and from my perspective i'm open to collaboration with even mentorship right because as i hear there's two elements here that alien sort of touched upon is we need resources because people just can't create stuff for themselves it's a lot of work but there's also on the flip side to that, the sort of reflecting on the, what is RE that allows for these kinds of pedagogies of synodality, of conversation, of conscientization, right? And that's sort of what I was trying to get to um, before with my work was how do I get to start thinking critically about their spaces that they can begin to be agents of transformation for that, right? Um, so it's, it's sort of that idea of, because all this, once you can have the pedagogy and the structures, it becomes a lot easier to open the space for reflecting about LGBTQ issues, about issues of, of race and uh, war that's taking place in Europe, for example, in the Middle East, etc. Um, so any thoughts or ideas, any sorts of mentoring, I uh, would be happy to, to take in uh, that help and assistance in where I can sort of contribute. And last thing, Nick, have you heard of Ish Ruiz? Okay. <laughs> He's awesome, doing really cool work. I love it. Yeah, Ish is fabulous. I was emailing someone about him earlier today, actually. Yeah, Ish. I, I saw Ish last week at um, the Imago Day conference. It's, it was the Marianist LGBT conference. Perfect. And his book is coming out soon. It looks like it's going to be really fantastic. Do you know the name so we can keep an eye out for it? Of the book? It is called, he, he sold a few advanced copies of the cover. It's called Cornerstones, um, Sacred Stories of LGBTQ plus employees in Catholic institutions. Uh -huh. um, he and another man are the editors and it's just stories, kind of like their, their dissertation work, stories of, I think folks who've been 
fired a lot of them from Catholic institutions for being queer. So it's called Cornerstones. Uh, New mm -hmm. Ways Ministries is published. Yeah. He also has a um, monograph coming out, which I think is his dissertation. Mm -hmm. Um, that's called LGBTQ plus educators in Catholic schools, embracing synodality, inclusivity, and justice. And it's coming out, I think, from uh, uh, Roman Littlefield. Oh, good. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes. What was okay. that name? What was the name of the person you were talking? Ish. Uh, Ish. I S H. Is his first name and Ruiz R U I Z is his last yeah, name. Yes, I just endorsed that book. Oh, you did? Yeah, Great. yeah, strongly. I, I just read the. I met him at uh, REA, um, or not REA, at CTSA. Yeah. In, back in June, and uh, he gave me a copy of it, and I read it. Uh, I read it the way I couldn't put it down. I read it the way home on the plane. I read it after I got home and I continued to read it. So then he contacted me to know what are the publisher. And I said I'd read it when I endorsed. So I did. It's a very fine, very fine book. It's it's a new breakthrough. Yeah. And uh, he's a new voice that'll that'll sing loud and clear for a long time, I hope. Agreed. Yes. All right. Well, on that note, we're coming toward the end here. And so general questions of where we, might we be called individually and collectively, but more specifically, uh, this is my last time facilitating the uh, Catholic community of practice. So uh, I put that in the uh, earlier email. And so somebody might be feeling inspired at that point and is free to speak up if they would like to, to take up uh, the, the mantle for the future um or uh, can t contact me later if uh, you want to think about it but uh, it certainly is not onerous but uh, is about trying to stay in touch with the group uh, especially in relation to what the group might like to do uh, for a particular year's program sometimes it's a, a more structured program last year we had a nice a uh, wonderful presentation by uh, two scholars from the Philippines uh, on their work uh, related to ecology and Catholic education, as well as a, a synodal process among uh, those of us who were present. So it can be more structured or less structured, topic uh, or no topic, uh, and keeping in touch with the REA leadership just about the logistics and keeping up information on the website. I'd like to keep notes on the website about each year's meetings so that anybody who's interested can uh, see what we've been doing over the previous years. So that's uh, it, it, the, the role is what you make it. So there is uh, is what the facilitation is about. So that's that piece of it. But uh, any concluding comments or questions? as we wrap just, up our time together. Just to say a thousand thanks to you, Maureen, for your wonderful leadership of our conversation the past uh, what, almost 20, oh, 10 years. Ten, almost 10 years. Yeah, eight. eight so, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's always always a joy to come together with this group. My goodness. No. Oh, no, you're, I can't hear you. You're muted. can't hear you. Yeah. You are unmuted, but still can't hear you. Oh, now you're muted. There. No. You can hear me. And I'm not muted. I am yeah, muted. can hear you now. Yeah. Just go close to the computer. Is the, uh, at least the leader of this uh, um, are you able to get a list of Roman Catholic members of the Religious Education Association in terms Bill, of uh, lists? You, we're going to close in a minute. Um, you can't get a list per se because of, of just the confidentiality factors, but you, through the networking coordinator, you are, we lost him, <laughs> you are able to communicate with the group. So um, that's how it works. You go through the networking coordinator. Sorry, we lost Noel, but I guess we're going to be cut off. So blessings and felicity. We should appoint him the new coordinator now that he's not here. <laughs> we should. <laughs> All right. 
That'll teach you not to learn it, leave early. <laughs> so, okay. Right. So we'll Thank be in touch. Blessings, everybody. Have a great one. the summer. Thanks, Mike.